Hey, greetings, friends. You're probably tuning in to another IEBC uh, session of the Board of Directors. The assignment I have today I share with Dr. Uh, Virginia Stewart, and that's 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17. And so I hope that you've been encouraged by the teaching of our Board of Directors, some great men of God and women of God that's really restructured and revitalized IEBC. At this point, I'm sort of at the end of the, uh, the conference, if you will, and this unprecedented the, uh, conference is online. Can you imagine? First time, I think, in history. I've been in biblical counseling movement since 1996 and certified in 99 or 2000, somewhere in there. But I've never really seen anything like this before. Of course, the pandemic is unprecedented as well. So my goal is that um, I help take you through this process. It, it may be a little different than what you may expect. I believe that um, I'm trying to make this uh, a practical theology, I'm trying to be faithful to the scripture, but make it a practical theology as well that you can utilize in your counseling session. So you will find that I'm going to provide three illustrations. Um, Tim Challies calls them visual theology. And so I um, want to use three particular visual theologies that I use in the counseling session that God has blessed. And so, and to start in this introduction, let's pray together, can we? Our Father, it's late into the um, conference. I'm thankful for all my brothers and sisters who were teaching and training, um, especially um, Warren Lamb, who is organizing all the um, the online videos and sessions, handouts, downloads, all that is technical. Thank you for his gifts and his faithfulness. Thank you for our leader, uh, Pastor Jeff Christensen and his vision and all my other brothers and sisters are support. I pray that you will teach us something in this process and help us through this journey, especially in the difficult days that we face um, so this world being upside down, it's more crucial than ever to be faithful to your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So in the 2020 IUBC conference, uh, I think that one thing we can start off with is understand is that people in crisis are definitely in need of change. Now they want change in some direction. They want change because they went out of pain. But I think every counseling philosophy and model would not argue the fact that people need to be a subject to change. It needs, something needs to change, they need to change. I think we would all agree. But this conference is focusing on handing off the baton, the biblical counseling baton to the next generation. And this can be complicated in many ways. There's a danger if you're not careful in handing off biblical counseling to the next generation. Can you imagine what Dr. Adams thought um, from a pure neuthetic movement? He started way back in the day, just trying to get pastors to use the Bible to fix problems rather than send them out to the professionals. And what he's seen today, I wonder how he sort of assesses all of this stuff. I, f I figured there's like three major things that could be dangerous. One is that there's too much cultural influence, negative cultural influence, in our current biblical counseling movement. Now that changes the face of biblical counseling to just one of many models. I just never really wanted that as a biblical counselor. I realized it was just a responsibility of the Word of God, both as a pastor, as a teacher, as a counselor, that we're not in competition to psychology, not at all. It's really the truth is that it's about the word of God. We'll, we'll explain more of that as we unpack this passage today. Another one is maybe we've kind of digressed to an optional faith-based counseling that's sort of generic and sort of benign because we've strayed away from the authority and sufficiency of scripture. That's, that's a possibility, that's a danger. And um, many people are doing that. In fact, there are many universities, seminaries right now today that have biblical counseling programs, biblical counseling, and taught by licensed 
therapist, psychologist, and they call it a biblical counseling degree, a biblical counseling um, program or, or certificate or degree. And they really are nothing more than an integrationist trying to combine the two together. The third thing is really the obvious that Paul talks to Timothy about in verses 1 through 6 in chapter 3. And that's the current future evil working against biblical counseling, working against us in the church. Now, it's important to understand that we are on the tail end of that. You can imagine all the things that Timothy went through and that he saw and experienced. Then all of a sudden we're in this spot of the world coming unraveled around us today. Can you imagine that uh, Supreme Court upheld that there's really no biological genderism? Yeah, who would have ever thought? Yeah, our brothers and sisters in the 50s and 60s and 70s would have never thought. They thought that the, um, those ages and those days of old were the wickedness of man. And they would, they would not believe what we were facing even today. So there is a, a, a problem with handing that over when people are not prepared for the current evil. And so I titled this message, Understanding the Biblical Protocol, Change Protocol. The origin, purpose, and methodology for a reason. And you'll see they sort of kind of unpack. It's not exhaustive, of course, but it does cover the main things. And in the time that I have with you, I wanted to be able to kind of uh, spur you into more um, study and faithfulness uh, with the Word of God as we go through it. First thing we have to understand is that psychology look, world looks for pain relief that pleases the client. Now, this may not be new news to you. But it's something that we have to understand that is sort of new to, to some. I'm having a, a number of people who are watching this today that are brand new counselors. Most of my brand new trained counselors, the new certified counselors are, are, are involved in the IABC uh, online training. And they're seeing, uh, they want to watch the, the uh, conference themselves. And so I'm just saying to you that there's sort of an agenda that's built into uh, psychology and their counseling is that, it's client-centered, it's man-centered or client-based. Whatever the client wants, we will do. If the abuse is too much, then just get out. If, uh, if you need to feel good about yourself, then let's work on feeling good about yourself. And biblical counseling is just the opposite. We look at what the believer's responsibility would be and the interaction of God's grace that addresses the pain and the change that pleases the Lord. Ephesians 5, 10, discern what is pleasing to the Lord. It's, it's profound. If you just would ponder on that, you would be satisfied to understand there, there's just such a, a, there are so polar opposites in their philosophy. Number two is that we realize that there's a vertical dimension of change that we can expect has to happen before we can expect any horizontal dimension of change in our counselees. Sometimes we forget that, that this whole problem is a spiritual problem, that we, we understand there's physiological things that happen, and we understand that there's things beyond our, our, um, our control that, that affect us. But the truth of the matter is that the vertical dimension, that is the relationship with God, what God says, what he thinks, our response to that, taking us out of the the leadership role of our own life to a, a dependent role with God. Now, the Jews saw this. Remember, the, they saw the Pharisees really a pretty good people. I mean, they keep the law. They sort of have this impeccable, um, meticulous religious uh, system that they're really good at. And so they always compared them religiously from the outside. And, of course, Matthew 5 and 6, Jesus walks on the scene, and he sees their self-sufficiency and their self-centeredness their pride, and their inner corruption. And guess what? The way he responded, we know it did not please God. And so we as counselors are sort of subject to the same thing. We're fooled by the outside appearance of people at times. People in crisis, people who come for help. And we sort of look, look at them as sometimes a victim. When the problem is always on the inside, these are statements that you probably already know, you've already understood, and, um, and it's good to review that because Mark 7, 20 through 23 reminds us that 
everything, not some things, everything that defiles a man comes from within. Now that's the, you'll find that's the very core of biblical counseling. You embrace that theology, you embrace that philosophy, and you're on the right path of biblical counseling. Number three, change must be an internal focus and journey. It's not a, it's not a pill. We're not dispensing scripture for a one-time thing. It's not a pain relief and you go on your way. It's a journey of change. And real change can only consistently happen to the external. When the internal changes, I'm going to get more into a, a visual theology, a practical illustration that's going to help you see that, that I hope that you can use in the counseling process. Real change happens at regeneration over the typical external reformation of people's lives. I always think about 2 Corinthians 5.14. They say they no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them. That's a radical change. That's, that's, a, that's a paradigm shift. That is a, that's a new life perspective. The old is gone in verse 17, and the new has come forth. I mean, it's, it's huge that they're the redemptive side of this thing, the regeneration provides the change. I can remember when I was in counseling myself in 1989, 90, my wife and I were just about in divorce court. We had a bunch of kids, his, hers, and our kids, six boys. And I had a serious anger problem. And, um, and so it was funny, but when he shared the gospel, my counsel was wise. He didn't start with anger. He started with the gospel. And when he shared the gospel with me, and my wife and I both, within a month, we came to faith in Christ. All of a sudden, I said, wow. I was telling my friends, I go, hey, you dealing with some of this? Yes, he's, he's eliminated a lot of my pain and problems. Not really true. Not true. There were so many perspectives that I didn't see before. I didn't see my self-centeredness. And so as we continue on, I want to show you how this happened to me. In 2 Timothy, as we move into the text, 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17, I'd like to help you see through some of this stuff. Work with me on this. Reading and starting verse 14. But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed. He uses the word continue. Meno uses that word because it's a strong word of, of continuing. It's, it's not... Um, you know, it, it's interesting that it's, it's, is that you need to stay firm there. You need to walk. You need to endure. It, it, it kind of, Piper uses it to explain the whole 14 to 17. And while the word continue is, 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 the, is the main word here, he needs to continue in what he learned. He says, knowing that from who you learned it, he's talking about his grandparent, his mother, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. I underline that which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. It doesn't start there. Why? Because all scripture is breathed out by God. We'll talk more about that in a second. Profitable. That's interesting. Use artios, which is really the word for adequate or capable. It's capable. It's very adequate, the word of God. It's adequate? Sure. Then why do people just use it just for salvation and move on to some methodology from Freud, Skinner, and Rogers? Because they don't trust in the sufficiency. He says it's adequate, profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction and training in righteousness, that the man of God, which is humankind, may be complete, equipped for every good work. Let's look at the origin of this um, thing that he's talking about. So what is he really talking about with Timothy? Look, looking from the top down and what he's doing with Timothy all the way from verse 1. Now we're in verse 14. He's saying this. First thing he's saying, Paul saying to him, Timothy, I want to hand you the, the torch. I want to give you the ministry of the word. Remember, Paul's moving out. God is taking him home. His nose, his days are numbered. And Timothy is the rising one that God has invested in, in ministry. And I might say that if you're a director or a pastor, who's the one that God is investing in your ministry? Who's going to replace you? Who will you pass the baton to? That's our theme of our, our conference. And Pastor Jeff uh, Christensen was thinking about that seriously. I think it came out of his mind and heart. And that, that we need to prepare people to run with this ministry instead of holding on to it like the, the system of the past. 
We want to prepare people. It's a theme of our conference. And it was a theme for Timothy in 1 Timothy 2. Paul made sure he was talking about that. He was saying, in essence, really, Timothy, guard the gospel and guard the truth. Which we can say that today. What kind of gospel is out there today is pitiful. It's pitiful. And what Paul reminds in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 6, said also to Timothy that there's evil people and evil things. I like what Dr. Eirich said about it. He said, it said, people will be lovers of themselves. It starts there, and then all those 10 or 15 vices and sins come out of that. It's the very core and essence of sin, isn't it? Lovers of themselves. Well, Timothy, you're going to face that. You're also going to face difficult times um, as you go through this thing. People are going to oppose the faith. They're going to oppose the faith. They're not going to, they're not going to help you. They're going to, really? Who would oppose the faith? There's plenty of them. They're going to infiltrate your ministry. And remember, Timothy, the very fabric of human society will come apart. Huh. We see that today. Just watch the news. Can't do it. It makes you just sick to your stomach. You can't do it. But the truth is, this is what's happening. But what he's saying to him, listen, when, when all hell breaks loose in that term, lean on the scriptures. Lean on the scriptures. That's all we have. Don't you understand? The scriptures have the power. Remember Spurgeon saying, you just let it loose and it'll do its work. Sometimes we think we have to manipulate and, and manage all these things and be, just use the word appropriately, love people where they're at and help them see the power of God's word. It'll do its work. And so another one, he says to Timothy, if you cling to the scriptures, you'll remain faithful and true to the end. I hope that's an encouragement to you because you may not be as eloquent as some of the other high profile counselors you may see at conferences. But I guarantee you that the people you will see in your world, minister in your world, will be times that you will need to cling to the scripture to help them that they would never see. But why, Timothy? Why is this happening? Well, he's saying the scriptures are the focus because they're accurate. They're what works in creation. Don't you know that in humankind, God created man. He knows them better than anything. That they're, the people are part of the spiritual DNA of God's creation and true followers of Christ. Only God knows the material and immaterial part of man. And I can tell you this. They're what really pleases the Lord. I can tell you this. Freud and Skinner and Rogers are frauds. They're soul care frauds. They can't help anyone. They just can help you stay in your sin. They can just help you love yourself and worship yourself and trust yourself. And that's all. And so I'm sure Timothy was exposed to of many of great scriptures. And he even said the sacred writings. And it was implied of the Old Testament, of course, is that his grandmother and him taught him some of the scriptures of the past. And here's one I'd like to share with you. From Isaiah 47 all the way through 55 are powerful um, scriptures. But the verse 11 is all that we have time for today. I'd like to share that with you for a moment. And notice that in this one verse, he used the word shall four times. That's pretty much a, an indicator for us, the frequency that he uses this word. And he used the word shall, so shall, he says this four times. And in both verse 11 and 12, there's about seven or eight times total in there. But in here is four times in here. And when he says, so shall, it's a verb that indicates a strong future tense. Here's how you need to look at it. It's a sovereign decree with ultimate authority. That's how it works. So he says that, so shall. Nobody else can say that. You can't guarantee what, what you do is going to produce the fruit that God can when he opens his mouth, when his word is released. He says, so shall my word that goes out from my mouth. Does that sound familiar? 2 Timothy 3.16. I call it the God-breathed sovereign inspiration right here in the Old Testament. In the New Covenant, of course, we see it there. He talks about that, but the inspiration is God-breathed. All scriptures God-breathed. Well, he's talking also about Isaiah 55, 11. So we see the sovereign inspiration. But here, it shall not return to me empty. Now we see the sovereign authority. You can't say it's not going to come back empty, that it's not going to do something. God can and I think that's what Spurgeon trusts so much when he said it's like a lion, just let it loose. It can defend itself. 
That's a sovereign authority. Then he says, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose. Purpose? That's the sovereign inerrancy of the scripture. It's inerrant. It's perfect. There's no error in it. There's no changing of it. It's, in, it's, it's perfect, immutable God. Is, here is a perfect idea of how that this word of God is so much power. I hope this is encouraging to you. And it shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. I call that sovereign sufficiency. Man, it's beautiful. You could just chew and eat and savor all those beautiful pictures of God's holy word. It should drive you to want more. Let me give it to you in a more modern day vernacular. This is a thought for thought translation. Let this kind of sink in your mind. This is like a little commentary of it, not word for word accurately, but it's, it's a good thought. Listen, it says in this thought for thought translation. It is the same with my word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. Wow. That's powerful. That's powerful. Do you know I even help teach my counselees this? Because I don't care where they're at when they come in and they're having some internal problems, some depression, anxiety, whatever. It's also an indication that they don't understand the power of God's word. They haven't, they haven't really gone and dissected and savor and live on and absorb everything out of the Psalms that they could learn all these things and understand the beautiful truths of God's word. And so I'm helping them see the power of God's word. Timothy was also exposed to Deuteronomy 32 too, I'm sure. Notice this, in this passage, instead of saying, so shall, he says, let my, let my teaching fall on you like rain. That's interesting, your teaching, yes. Let my speech settle like dew. There's the sovereign word again. And then he says, let my words, so he uses teaching, speech, and words, fall like rain on tender grass, like gentle showers of young plants. Now we see the sufficiency of the word of God. It, it was sent out to do a purpose. It, it, was, it rained on these tender plants, and, and these gentle showers of young plants would take it in and grow. The theme of Timothy's ministry, really, and Paul was saying, is that your entire ministry is a ministry of the Word of God. I know that's not very profound, but it's biblically true. It's not just in counseling. So the biblical counseling movement today is sort of a progressive movement, considering the days of Adams. And leaning more to the philosophical than the theological. All the theological is to end antiquitous, it's, it's old school, it's old Adams, we've got to change the name, we've got to change this, we've got to change that. We don't trust this, we don't trust that, and, and nothing's changed in the Bible even since Adams. And so we've, we've become more professional in our biblical counseling movement. We're sort of buying into cultural covertly, covertly, adopting certain influences of doctrine like, like this one, the secular doctrine of abuse. And so we buy into this automatically grounds our rights for divorce. I realize there are circumstances that are beyond your control. And I know that we have responsibilities to help people and keep them safe. But it's not an automatic when there could be reconciliation. It's not automatic grounds for divorce. It's not the other exceptional exception clause, if you would. Or what about the shifting blame to some of the hard sciences? That's what's happening today as well. Um, some of the sin is called from epigenetics. Well, it's not their fault. Their parents did this. They changed their cell structure. And because of epigenetics, they're doing this. Or because we surrendered to some clinical, biological reasons for depression, like SAD, the SAD syndrome, and chemical imbalances, and so many other things that the, the world is, the influences and the toxins that we've been breathing sort of re- organize our, our preferences and our, our, um, our, our word, the way we teach the word of God, of course. And then what about the submission to and re redefining of the gospel with the social gospel message? That's just another attack on the word of God, that's all. So if we're not careful in handling the, handing over these, uh, the future of biblical counseling to our next Bible-believing generation, um, 
we will be frogs in the boiling water. And you've heard the illustration because become victims of a deluded ministry of the word of God, moving away from the objective scriptures to subjective professionalism. Next thing you know, we're doing therapeutic counseling under the faith base umbrella. Let's take the bigger picture here. Let's talk about the purpose in 2 Timothy 3. I'm going to read 14 and 15. And then I want to give you a, a picture of this. 14 and 15. Here it is. But as for you, continue in what you have learned, Timothy, and have firmly believed. See, what you've learned is not a learning problem. You've got marriage problems. You don't go to another seminar. It's not, it, it, what you believe about the Bible isn't as strong as what, what you what you, when what you learn about the Bible is not as strong as what you believe about it and how you respond to that. Knowing from whom you learned it and how that from childhood you've been acquainted, the sacred writings, and here it is, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. So the first thing I want you to see is the scriptures, and, and from 14 and 15, and we're going to talk 16 and 17, 14 and 15, they're salvific. The scriptures are salvific. We forget that. We jump right into fixing problems. We jump right into trying to be a problem solver. But the scriptures are designed to be salvific. And in 16 through 17, the scriptures are breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training righteousness, that the man of God may be completely equipped for every good work. They're also sanctifying. So they have a salvific work, but they have a sanctifying work. Remember in John 17, 17, Jesus said, sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. We have to understand that if you're counseling without the Bible, you've just been, you've just practiced integration. The Bible interprets reality perfectly. What I do for my counselees a lot of times, I help them see that we, we study the scripture and we, we approach the scripture knowing what our relationship with God is. And we look at it from the scripture. And when they announce that they're, they're saved, that they, they know that they've been forgiven and that they're following the Lord, we flip them over and that very scripture that was to save us now feeds us the rest of our life. Wow. It says a dual purpose. The same one that gave you life sustains life. It has two divine purposes and special revelation, if you would. Again, we're staying in the general. I want you to see this in a, in a picture of 14 through 17. The first one is scripture is sufficient, has power to make one wise into salvation. It's not just power for that, it's sufficient. Look, you look on your website. I looked on our website before we ever started going to this church. And I saw our pastor use the word sufficient a number of times. He used it a number of times in his, in his sermons. I said, you know what? I have rarely ever seen the polity and the doctrine, and the constitution of a church that would include the sufficiency of scripture. Well, they like to talk about the authority, the inerrancy, they want to talk about all that stuff, but sufficiency is critically important. I said, that's a church I need to attend. The second thing in the scriptures from 16 to 17 is the scriptures are purposeful. It means they're beneficial for teaching, conviction, correction, and training through sanctification. So it's just another way of saying it. They're salvific and sanctifying. They're sufficient and they're purposeful. So they're all encompassing, ready to do what they need to do. They're, they're designed to help your counselee. They're designed to bring you into a, a peaceful walk with Jesus Christ on the inside. It's important that our theology proper moves us to a practical theology. And that's why a lot of people won't talk about sufficiency because they leave in the option of practical theology to the congregation. So if they want to do integration and you call them Christian counsel, go to it, go for it. That's fine. As long as you're in here and I'm going to, you're going to listen to my teaching and preaching. No, we have to have our theology proper it must include a practical theology. So the scriptures are really designed to save you and are sufficient to change you. But there's two other specific uses. If we're coming from a different angle, two other specific uses of the scripture for all counselors and ministers of the word of God. Number one, we're saying 14 to 16, their evangelism, we do, we have, our perspective is evangelism for reconciliation. People need to hear the gospel, repent and believe and be saved. They do. They do. So evangelistically, we need to work with the scripture. I use biblical counseling as an evangelistic tool. 
I know that you evangelize your church as they come in. God's doing the work there. Um, you finally come through people. I didn't know that. And they come to faith in Christ, and that's wonderful. But have you ever fished for people with hope? Give them hope. And when they come in, we evangelize them. I hope so, because that's one of the reasons for the scriptures, to evangelize them, with, to reconcile them with God, to reconcile them with their families. That's how I did it. I reconciled with all the people I had hurt and broken. And so I realize that evangelistic approach to this is very critical. The second thing is it's instructional. So it has both these elements. It's evangelistic, it's instructional. It's saying the same thing, only I'm flipping it over for the different uses here. Adams used the word edify, the edify for transformation. I use the word instruction. Edifying is right. Believers must be built up in their faith, changed from their sinful behavior to God honoring righteous ways. Now remember, this is sort of revealing the premise of a pre-counseling doctrine. We're teaching pre-counseling and biblical counseling. It's, uh, it's unprecedented for any other counseling model. They don't do this. They believe they get right into problem solving. What do you want? How do you feel? What do you think? And we get into right into, we help them see where their, their relationship to God, what it is vertically will, will parallel horizontally in their life. Your love for God will translate in your love for your spouse. Your love for God will translate in how you approach and you love others, your neighbor. And so we realize that this is a pre-counseling approach. And it's almost forgotten in biblical counseling today, the new modern biblical counseling. Remember that followers of Christ is the most important thing. It's, it's a different counsel. Now, I, I do talk about their problem. If they want to, we talk about it. But I'm, I'm giving a lesson we're working on, and the homework is designed to be evangelistic. You may run people away. You think, well, I came in for marriage. Mark, why are, you, why are we doing this? Um, I've had that happen before. And I'm going to show you a, an illustration I use to help. So you, this, was what, this is one thing about the evangelistic approaches. This is what I'm going to say this to you very clearly. This is why you as a counselor must be proficient as a black belt in the dojo, as a PhD in the classroom with the gospel and understanding soteriology. You better understand it from Bible's perspective. You better understand how to open scriptures anyway and evangel anywhere in there and evangelize someone. How well do you know the gospel? I can just say this to you. A lot of my students, I start off and have them write out what the gospel is. When they pass it in, I, and I read through it, I'm evangelizing some people in the class. Because you can get 50 different gospel presentations in some form or other um, when you do that. It's, it's eye-opening. So if you don't evangelize your counseling, if you don't really have the vertical perspective before you get into the horizontal problems, you're going to find yourself very frustrated with the lack of interest in your counseling. If that's the case, you need to go back to the cross. I don't care if they got... 20, 40 years as a deacon. I don't care if they have 20 years experience in ministry or they've been founders of a church. I, one guy told me I was one of the founding members of this church 55 years ago, still needed to be evangelized. And so I'm going to show you some visual theologies I talked about to help you understand what's going on because the missing element in real change is this new life, this inside regeneration, transformation. It's unbelievable. That's the supernatural work of God. I tell my counselees, listen, I want to show you what's missing. You've had, how many times you've been counseled? And they tell me all the different counseling centers they've been to and all the different approaches and Rogerian and Skinnerian and all of it. I said, well, here's what's missing. I go up to the board and I draw this illustration for you. It's called the parallel counseling principle. And I hope that you can use it. I, what I do is where you see uh, the counselee listed there, I draw a stick man on the board. I just draw a stick man. And the bottom line is what they stand on. That's really what their foundation is. The top line is coming right towards their head because that's what they experience. That's what they see. That's what they think. That's where, that's where the pain and the challenges, the trials, the tribulations come from. And so I help them see this. Most counseling just deals with the top line only, the external, the temporal. And it's, so it's like a Band-Aid approach. But real change happens when you deal with the heart of the issue we talked about that in Mark 7, 20 through 23. And so the heart of the issue, what you really believe about God affects 
and promotes or affects the pain that you're experiencing. It does. And so I help and I draw that center line from the bottom line up. And if you'll notice the uh, illustration to the right, I write out there these issues there. I put on there that there's, you know, how they see the problem, how they respond to the problem. You know, how, what do they really believe about God in the problem? It, it reveals a lot about you and what you believe about God. And so if you're always a victim, if you have all these rights, if you have all these entitlements, then the, the scripture hasn't gone deep into your heart. It hasn't humbled you to be a humble servant of God. And so I help start off with that because then when I give them homework with the gospel, they know that it's a twofold approach. See, here's what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that because we're changing your theology, because we're helping you with your faith, because you're digging deeper into the scripture, because that you're considering what God thinks about this and it's affecting your own heart, it's going to affect how you see your problem. That's what happened to me. I had 14 offenses against my wife in counseling. I wrote them down meticulously and I was a detective. So I had, I had evidence marked A, B, and C, and D, and I had evidence wrapped. I interviewed my little kids. Hey, tell them how bad mommy is to dad. And we would do all that. And I, I packaged all that and I had 14 of them written out with all the meticulous documentation. And my wife, when I looked over, the, she gave him one. She just had one big thing written across the, the page. And I was like, she is going to lose because who has the most evidence wins. And what I didn't know is that she said on there, I, he said, well, let's start with yours. I said, no. And so I said, we're going to start with my wife. Of course, he, he understood that I was carrying a couple guns at that time. And I still didn't know what was going on. But I, I, just, saw, I just said, no, we're not starting with me. We're starting with her. Tell me what she said. And he's kind of snickered. And he said, she just put on here, he's a jerk. And that summarized everything. He told me that says a lot. That says a lot. So you have all these meticulous sayings. And I tell you, when I came to faith in Christ, all of a sudden that the, the whole list, except for one or two things that I need to, to reconcile, was dissipated. It was gone. Because how I viewed it, it wasn't like the pain of all that stuff was gone. It's like I didn't see it the same way. I wasn't offended the same way. And so I tell my counselee that your study of the word of God. And I tell them this before we get to this point. This is one or two sessions, into one session or two. I say, I want you to know this. Chemotherapy, what, what chemotherapy is to cancer, the word of God is to sin. Now you don't go, you, know, you won't run with stage three or four cancer to the, to the doctor to get chemotherapy if your schedule allows it. If you have time for it. I was just too busy this week. No, no. You're not treating your problem on the internal side of your heart. You're not dealing with your spiritual, you're still offen offensive to God and others. You have to deal with this like chemotherapy. And I call it chemotherapy throughout the counseling. And they see it and they start doing it. So when they're working hard on the, they have marital problems and I'm helping them with the communication and all the things that are just things, but it's just minor. We're helping really working on the gospel <laughs> and they never complain anymore. They used to just run. I said, this is not about counseling. He's just here trying to evangelize me. But it means everything. It means everything. So our counseling has some particular sim simple goals. We're to evangelize the lost. We're to instruct and edify the saved. Okay? That's pretty simple. Let's talk about the four-step process and the methodology a little bit. Another illustration. I got this idea from John Piper and, and I didn't perfect it, but I made it more biblical counseling. And so this is what I would call um, the four-step process from verse 16. Verse 16, talking about teaching and reproof and correction and, and training in righteousness. And he talks about this four-step process here. That he, as we outline this, remember the idea, what was came to my mind and what was really sort of an epiphany to me was that the teaching started the process. Everything came out of the teaching process. And so as I, I realized that when I teach what is right, and that's sort of an old Worsby saying that he had in his Beaks commentaries, I can't tell you how many years ago, but anyway, what is right? Teach them what is right or what is true in the scripture. And what flows out of that is a, a reproof of what you're doing that is not right. 
What it identifies whatever you're doing, you need to stop doing. And by conviction, the turn, you see that on the corner? The turn starts happening. It's turning by conviction. And they're bearing under conviction. They stop doing what, is, what, they're, what they are doing. I had confronted a, a young couple who was wanting to get married. They were living together, and I just didn't say anything about it. I just opened the Bible. We started studying, and it came up, and they read it. And I said, so what does God say is right? Yeah, to be morally pure. Right. Yes. And that started developing conviction, and the young man moved back with his parents till they'd been married and repented. And then the turn starts happening in correction, flowing out of the teaching. It makes the turn in conviction. And now they're wondering, how do I get it right? Once there's repentance, that's where put off and put on happens. And if you're doing the put off and put on before there's conviction, before there's repentance, you're going to make Pharisees out of your counselees. And so there's a turn and there's correction. And then finally, it's making you move back to the sacred scripture, sacred writings, and that's discipline, training, and righteousness, as Dr. Adams would, would say. And if you want to know more about these four steps, you would read the book, because it's all about 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Actually, 14 through 17. It's How to Help People Change by J. Adams, a 1986 book. Amazing. I reread it. It's just, it's brilliant. And it's a simple approach, but the truth is, these were written in a particular divine order. So you can't, you, they don't have power individually when you take them out of context of the scripture. They were written in the order that you're going to open the sacred scripture. God's word will not return empty, void. And it starts doing its work. And it goes back and over and over again. So in the counseling session, you're dealing with this and depression. What is right? What is not right? How to get it right and how to keep it right. Remember in Hebrews 5.14, it says that we, that these Mature people practice these things so they can discern what is evil and good. Practice is the key word. And so train in righteousness. Sometimes we're cutting our counselees loose too soon. They haven't developed the habits and being rehabituated towards righteousness. We just fix the pain went away so we're gone. No, it's now we need to rehabituate uh, into righteous practices. Number two, biblical change happens that with the ministry of the word, private and publicly. Doctor, uh, I know that Randy Patton, um, that's how he ministers to people, teach them Acts 20, 20. There's a public use and a private use of the word. And so you need to know that, that you as a counselee is not, that's not all that everyone needs. They need the body of Christ. They need to connect with the body of Christ. That's important. That's more important than your expertise as a counselor. It's just part of it. It's like a tip of the iceberg, but you need to get them connected. So the, off, the counseling office is the tip of the spear, and we need to connect them to the body of Christ. That's important. That's our ministry. You must connect them to the body of Christ. And if you're, if you're evangelizing somebody on the other side that is not even, is barely in Christian orthodoxy or barely knows the scriptures, you know, it's, it's detrimental to stick them back into the, that's, I always call their pastor. I, I, I try to meet with them and say, hey, can I, have the, can I have these folks for just a season to get them back on track? And then if they want to come back, I'm, I'm going to encourage them to come back. <clears throat> uh, at least try to do that. But let me show you the last um, illustration that's important to your counseling ministry. This was strictly on my heart and mind. God gave this to me, and I've just been using it ever since. And so how do I connect them? I say, well, you have to go to church. I, I want to do something better than that. So in the ministry cycle, you can see there what I did. What I did on this is that I helped them. This is part of the methodology. But I helped them see that, that there has to be a, a, a bigger picture of support than just the biblical counseling. Because remember, the mindset of people coming listening to TV and Oprah and Dr. Phil and all of them is that they, have a, they need a specialist. You need an expert. You need a professional. You need licensure. You need all that. And they don't understand they really need the body of Christ. They need the body of Christ. If you have a poor ecclesiology, you're, you're not going to be a very good counselor. The Bible says that we're to fellowship with one, one to another. And so this ministry cycle talks about the flow of the church. And so what I tell them is this. You can see the flow. You can fill in your own. 
ministries. I just plugged in our ministries at Timberlake Baptist Church. And, um, and I say, you know, we have corporate worship. Here's what we do. Here's how we do it. I have them get a bulletin, take notes. They bring it in. We discuss for five minutes what the ministry, what the, what the uh, exposition message was, what it was about. And I, because I wanted them engaged. I don't want them to come just listening. I want them to engage. And then I want them to go to the PM service if they can. I want them to go take, you know, Bible studies if they're, they're available or do Bible studies at home, do your homework. Uh, involve themselves in the small groups, maybe personal discipleship if somebody's offering that or a Sunday school class, whatever. And then, and then you're eligible for another counseling. When, they, when you've completed that cycle for the week, as much as you can, your schedule allows, we're going to counsel again. And let me tell you something that happens. This is brilliant. I don't know how it happened, but it happens. Typically, the counselees that I'm fishing for and I'm evangelizing or that have been on the outskirts of the church but using their membership to get out of hell or whatever, what happens is they come to me and ask me, how can I join this church? long before we're finished in counseling happens. And so this, we call it the ministry cycle. I plug them into the ministry cycle and also use advocates when I can. So our advocates, um, this is uh, Garrett Higby's idea, but the advocates are important uh, because they will see that they get the counseling, they'll help them with childcare, they take them out to lunch, they encourage them, they call them up, they pray for them, they sit by them in church. Uh, advocates are the, the touch of the body of Christ. And the ministry cycle is critically important. And critically important. I can't say it enough. And that if you're not in, in requiring people to go to church that are in counseling, you will ultimately lose them. Then counseling is more about you than them. I can tell you. And finalize this. The idea is that the trust in the sufficiency of Scripture the trust and sufficiency of scripture identifies genuine biblical counseling. Everything else calling himself biblical counseling is a fraud. They don't believe in the sufficiency of scripture where the scriptures alone are the answers to life problems. It's a fraud. It's true. And so verse 16 and 17 um, to complete the characteristics of the sufficiency of scripture. And I think that's what this whole message is about. I, I end with this particular passage, 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4. His divine power has granted us all things, not some things, not many things, all things, that pertain to life, that's the soul and the spirit of man, and godliness, that's their growth and their sanctification. That's their likeness to Christ. Why are you a Christian if you're not growing in the likeness of Christ? Well, God has given us everything we need that pertains to life and godliness, everything. We, so he didn't bring us Freud. One guy said, well, maybe he brought us Freud. Maybe he brought us Skinner. Maybe he brought us Rogers. No. No. Those guys are dead to God, enemies of the gospel. Through the knowledge of him. Through the knowledge of him, yeah, who's called us to his own glory and excellence. By which he has granted to us, what did he grant to us? His precious and very great promises. Where do you find that? Word of God. So through them, through the scripture? Are you kidding me? That's it? Yep. You may become partakers of the divine nature. Why? You'll escape the corruption that is in this world because of sinful desires. Sin no longer has, is my master. I died and I rose with Christ. I'm following him. I no longer live for myself, but for him who died for me. The new life perspective, all through the scripture and the sufficient word of God. So I pray that this is helpful to you. And may God bless you in the ministry of his word today. And that you won't allow cultural influences as you grab the baton and go on to the next one. We're old. We're going to move past and sit under your teaching. Just remember the word of God has all the work is done there. Amen. Let's pray. So, Father, I pray that um, you use this time to encourage some souls that are confused, maybe new people who 
have had a professional view of the Word of God, a systematic view in the sense of it being um, pragmatic, that it's just part of a, a massive plan. And we forgive us for where we've you know, stooped low and snuck through and, and used psychological techniques and principles when your word was so sufficient. We just didn't trust it. So help us today. Thank you for this conference and all my brothers who taught up to this point. And as Pastor Jeff and, and Pastor Kevin close this um, conference out, I pray that you'll uh, be kind to them, gracious to them. We love you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.